So in the last portion of today's lecture, I want to bring things back to the bigger picture. I want to revisit some of the concepts that we talked about actually in the first lecture of the class. And now that we have uh, you know, better perspective for having learned about a number of uh, reinforced learning methods, maybe we can think back to those ideas and think about uh, how what we've learned affects how we should think about them. So in the very first lecture in this class, I talked about how learning could be viewed as the basis of intelligence. That perhaps uh, we can think about reinforcement learning as the mechanism that allows us to reason about decision making and how deep models can allow RL algorithms to learn and represent complex input output mappings. And how together, deep models are what allow reinforcement learning algorithms to solve complex problems end to end. So let's come back to this big idea and, and let's uh, think about how the things we discussed today might uh, inform our, 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 our consideration of this. The thing that I want to bring up here is a, is a slide that's actually borrowed from uh, a talk by Jan Lacoon. Uh, this slide takes a, an interesting perspective on what it takes to train an intelligent machine by reasoning about uh, the information required to learn about the world. So at a very high level, you, can, you, can, you could imagine that in order to behave intelligently in realistic settings, you need to acquire a certain amount of information, right? So at some basic level, no matter how smart you are, no matter how good your deductive reasoning skills are, if you don't know anything about the world, if you don't have any information about the world, then you won't be able to behave intelligently. So at some very, very crude high, high level, you could imagine the problem of training an intelligent machine is just the problem of stuffing enough information to the computer. But there is some reason to believe that this view is sensible because uh, what we've seen over the last decade or so is really the triumph of data-driven methods. And data-driven methods are really all about stuffing enough information to the computer. Basically, it's hard to write down a succinct set of rules that allow you to, for example, recognize a pedestrian in a picture for an autonomous car. But if you've seen many, many examples, then you can figure out all the edge cases, exceptions, corner cases, all the special cases, and then you can get it right. Basically, if the world is difficult to describe with a succinct, simple set of hand-designed rules, and you really need all the exceptions, weirdness, and special cases, then you need a lot of information to figure out all those ex exceptions, weirdnesses, and special cases. So the argument that Jan LeCun makes on this slide is that different learning procedures have different levels of information density. Ultimately, the information that you're giving to the computer comes from the supervision. For example, in supervised learning, the supervision is the label. If you are training with supervised learning on something like ImageNet, each label might have about 10 bits of information, right? You have 1,000 labels, it's about 10 bits. So while the images are highly varied and diverse, each image gives you about 10 bits, which means that if you have a million images, you have 10 million bits of supervision. Just 10 megabytes worth of supervision. If you're doing reinforcement learning, Jan LeCun argues that the density of supervision is lower. This is a debatable perspective, and I'll, and I'll provide some uh, counterpoints to this later, but for now we could say that, well, maybe each sample actually has very little information, especially if each sample, ha if you have sparse rewards, each sample might have a reward of zero, so the actual density of supervision might in fact be very, very small. If you are, however, doing some kind of unsupervised learning, for instance, if you're predicting the future, then the number of bits of supervision is equal to the number of bits required to describe the future. So if you're predicting, in the extreme case, maybe the next image from the current image, you might have millions of bits of supervision per sample. So the information density of that is much higher. So Jan LeCun's argument on the slide is that we really need to think about unsupervised uh, or predictive learning methods if we are to ever hope to get machines that are truly intelligent, because to be intelligent, they'll need to pack in a lot of information about the world, and unsupervised learning provides that density of supervision, ironically enough, whereas supervised learning in RL might not. And crucially, when I say pack information to the machine, I don't, need, I don't mean pack human knowledge. You know, supervised learning gives you human knowledge, unsupervised learning doesn't, but unsupervised learning gives you observational knowledge about the world. It allows you to learn about physics, about causality, about the structure of the universe. Okay, so this is maybe some food for thought. Uh, and perhaps what we can do is we can then ask, 
well, where do we want the supervision signal to come from? Where do we want the information to come from? There is the Jan LeCun's cake perspective, which is that unsupervised or self-supervised learning, uh, learning predictive models, model-based RL, will give us the information density needed to acquire intelligent behavior. Uh, and it gives you a lot to do before you even accomplish any goal. Before the cheetah has even caught its first gazelle, it can learn about how gazelles move, how the wind sw sweeps over the savanna, all sorts of things can be figured out before accomplishing any goal and receiving any reward. But it's not the only way to think about the supervision signal. Maybe supervision uh, is just as much an artifact of other agents as it is of the physical properties of the environment. Maybe a big part of why we're able to drive cars, build airplanes, and uh, use computers is not because we are individually so smart, but because we live in a society and the understanding and imitation of other agents leads to the kind of rich supervision signal we need in order to acquire meaningful behaviors with reasonable levels of sample complexity. Another explanation, which I think is also actually very reasonable, is that the Jan LeCun's cake is wrong. Maybe it's wrong in the sense that reinforcement learning does not provide a small number of bits of supervision. Maybe reinforcement learning actually provides a very large number of bits. And maybe all it takes is just a little bit of reward. Because when that little bit of reward is propagated through the dynamical system, propagated through all the transitions that you've seen, it actually creates a very large volume of supervision. So predicting which state is rewarding might not be all that hard. But predicting which state has high value might be a much more complex problem. The value function combines the dynamics and the reward, thereby leading to a much richer supervision signal. And maybe that's actually all you need. And maybe we don't need to worry so much. Maybe we just need better, more powerful, basic RL methods. And all it takes is one plus one. Of course, the answer could also be all of the above. It could be that we need to combine many different sources of supervision. Maybe the problem is so difficult that uh, we really need to utilize unsupervised learning and prediction. We really need imitation understanding of other agents, and we really need good basic RL algorithms that can derive a rich source of supervision from only a small amount of reward. So the point that I want to leave you with at the end of this lecture is this one. How should we go about answering these questions? Well, the first point that I'm going to make here is it's very important to pick the right problems. Don't be too swayed by benchmark tasks. Reinforcement learning is kind of this uh, peculiar hybrid field that combines elements of optimization and elements of machine learning. In optimization, we typically emphasize how well you do at solving an optimization problem. In machine learning, we emphasize how well you do at generalizing. A lot of current reinforcement learning benchmarks are really optimization benchmarks. And we need to consider the kind of problems that are representative of real-world complexity, real-world diversity, and real-world difficulty. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do robotics and work with robots. It could mean that you tackle data-driven reinforcement learning problems in, let's say, dialogue generation, or you think about logistics, operations research, RL in healthcare, RL in education. So many rich, interesting, and diverse problems are there for the taking that have not yet been addressed successfully with RL. So pick the right problems. Even if you evaluate your algorithm on simple benchmark domains, consider what problem you're really trying to solve and make sure that the algorithmic innovations you come up with are actually going to have potential to address those really difficult and important problems that are actually motivating you to do this research. Pay attention to generative models, prediction, other fields of machine learning rather than just RL algorithms. It's quite likely that the next major innovation in RL will not come from better core RL ideas, but from bringing in the right ideas from other fields that change how we think about these problems, change our assumptions, change our problem formulations, or just bring in new uh, ways of thinking about algorithms that have not occurred to the decades of reinforcement learning researchers that came before. And carefully understand the relationship between RL and other fields. RL in some ways is not that different. At some level, RL is about matching distributions, distributions of exponentiated rewards. At some level, it's about dealing with distributional shift. All of these are things that other fields in machine learning have also tackled in one way or another. And it's important to uh, get that perspective, understand the relationship to those fields, understand what's the same, understand what's different, and understand which new ideas can be brought in. So that's all I have to say about this topic. I wish you all the best of luck on your final projects. 
Uh, and of course, do make sure to come to the guest lectures, interact with our guest speakers, and ask them questions.